Will you turn with me to the book of 1 Samuel? May I direct your attention to the third chapter in the 10th verse. Brother Nathaniel, St. Matthew's Gospel, 11th chapter and 15th verse. Brother Jesse, 1 Corinthians, chapter number 13 and verse number 11. If you're saved and you know it, say amen. amen. Brother Ray, does it feel as good back there as it does up here? Jesus is just as real back there as he is up here this morning. He's so powerful among us. And I'm glad you all took time to let the Holy Ghost have his way. I know we're getting on closer to 12 noon now, and I'm standing between you and fried chicken. But there's something that tastes even better than fried chicken, and it's the words of his mouth, the word of God. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. And so if it's chicken 30 for you, I want to ask you to make it word 30. Can we have just a few minutes for the word of God? Can I keep your attention for just a few minutes? Uh, Brother Nathaniel, read Matthew 11 and 15, please. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Amen. Did everybody hear that? <laughs> I'm going to preach a sermon this morning, the Holy Ghost titled, I Need a Hearing Aid. Brother Nathaniel, I heard what you said. I heard what you read. Uh, Brother Jesse, 1 Corinthians chapter number 13, verse number 11. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. How many of you know a hearing aid is not a childish thing? A lot of mature people have hearing aids because they recognize their inability to hear correctly and they don't want to misunderstand anyone or misinterpret anything or fail to hear what they need to hear. And so they buy a hearing aid. Hey, I need a hearing aid. So if we could stand for the reading of our text this morning, 1 Samuel chapter number 3 and verse number 10 the Bible said, And the Lord came and stood and called as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel answered, Speak, for thy servant heareth. Would you stretch your hand toward heaven and ask the Lord of heaven to help us? Heavenly Father, we love and we praise you. We thank you for the privilege to be in the house of the Lord. We pray that you would anoint us. I pray that you would set a guard at my mouth and help me to say the things that you would have me to say. Nothing more or less than not the ears of this thy people, that they might be able to hear what it is the Spirit is saying unto this church this morning, unto these people through this blessed word of God. Not my words, but through your word. I pray that we would not depart this place sorrowfully, but rather joyfully. In Jesus' name, amen. Look at your neighbor and say, hey neighbor, do you need a hearing aid? All right, we'll find out if they need one here or not momentarily. Our text is found in an Old Testament book of the Holy Bible. The book of 1 Samuel introduces us to one of the primary characters of this book. And it's the author of this book of the Bible, the prophet Samuel. I appreciate this book of the Bible. When I was a young preacher so many years ago, I preached out of the books of 1 and 2 Samuel. I found that within these narratives, there were special characters that were fascinating. Also, there were valuable lessons contained in these writings. How many of you appreciate the Old Testament? I appreciate the New Testament. I appreciate the entire counsel of God. Every word that is written between these two leather binders is so special. And I thank God for it. Brother Nathaniel, there's so many lessons to be learned. Our Sunday school teachers and preachers that are present this morning could say, oh yes, without a doubt. I could teach until the time of my death and never scratch the surface of the wonderful things that God has hidden in this word of God for us. As I would read the books of 1st and 2nd Samuel, I would find that there's never a dull moment in this writing. This book is full of action figures, if you would. These men of God were busy. They were always on the move. God's got a plan and God's got a man. And God doesn't have time for any slothful people. The men of God were fascinating and they were very busy doing the work of God. So there was never a dull moment. 
Brother Rick Jacobs spoke fondly of his recently deceased grandson, Jed, who passed away last Sunday morning at the age of 16 unexpectedly. But he said that that young man lived life to the fullest. He just would not let a moment pass him by. He was not a slothful man. And I believe that in our company here this morning, there are people that are industrious. How many of you remember the sermon that I preached? The VIP treatment. Among us are men of valor. There are people that have integrity. We know that there are people right here this morning that are not slothful. And I know that the man Samuel was not slothful. We find right here that this book is very appealing to the reader. The events in 1 Samuel may be from long ago and from a land far away, yet these words are so relevant to us today. The struggles these men faced, yes, they had natural battles, but they are similar to our spiritual battles. Yes, they had health issues and physical ailments, just like you and I have, but we find that they believed that the Lord was their helper and healer. These people face things that we face today. A wise man and a woman would read and learn from their successes and failures. A wiser man and woman would hear what the Spirit saith unto the church, those that are present in this building this morning. If you'll take another look, at our text, 1 Samuel chapter number 3, verse number 10, the Bible said a very special visitor came down to Samuel. And the Lord came and stood and called as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel answered, Speak for thy servant heareth. May I point out that the Lord was present. According to the word of God, the Lord was standing nearby. But he was not discernible with the natural eye. But somehow his voice was detectable and discernible. So yes, even though you could not see the physical being of the Lord, he was present and his voice was speaking. And we are encouraged by this as a New Testament church, a body of believers. We are here this morning and we do not see the Lord's physical body, but we can see members of his body and no doubt we have already been ministered to by the voice of the Lord. How many of you appreciate the good Holy Ghost? We're just singing normal songs. Going through the lyrics, chapter and verse, if you would. Going through the lyrics, verse and chorus and at some point it seems like God breathes words of encouragement into that service and we realize we have the presence of the Lord in the house and we can truly say this is God's house and somehow we have an audience with the king and so this young prophet Samuel had been reared up in a family that was a God fearing family those of you that are Bible students and readers you will know that Samuel's mother had been infertile. We find that there was somebody else in her life named Penaniah that was able to have children. That they were both the wives of a man that was a God-fearing man. One was fruitful and multiplying while Miss Hannah was unfruitful and could not bring forth children. We find that even though things were not going as Hannah felt like they should go for the child of God, she was still faithful to go to the house of God every time there was a demand that God's children gather together. The Bible said, Forsake not the assembling of yourself together as the matter of some is, even so much more as the day of the Lord approaches. How many of you know that it pays to be in the house of the Lord? I remember years ago there became a concern in my heart that that one particular service, maybe that Sunday night service or that Wednesday night service, could have been my service or that particular meeting that the Lord met with me personally. And we find that this was the case in the life of Hannah. One particular time she came to the house of God and she stealed away in privacy and solitude and began to pray over there on the end of the altar. And she had a heavenly visitor, the good Holy Ghost, come down. And the Spirit of God moved on her. And as she began to pray, the power of God come down and she was blessed her promise was given we find that Hannah had been childless up until this time but her husband kept coming to church Hannah kept coming to church and 
now they no longer are dealing with infertility issues because God has heard and answered her prayer. You see, she had prayed specifically for a son. She had promised the Lord that she would give him back to the Lord by dedicating him to the Lord and his service. How many of you know that if you make a promise to the Lord in the midst of a crisis, you've got to keep that promise. Keep that promise. We find that this woman needed something desperately. And she was praying for it in the house of God at the altar of God. And when the Spirit of God descended upon her in that altar, she knew she better keep her promise because the Lord could reach out to that gift as quick as he gave it. The Bible said, the Lord giveth and taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. So Samuel comes from a family of promise keepers. Brother Nathaniel, I feel like he would remember the time that his father and mother brought him to the house of God to be dedicated to the Lord in his service. She followed through on her promise, Sister Howell, and she brought that same Samuel, not another Samuel, not another child, not an adopted child. She brought that same Samuel to the house of God. The Bible teaches us that because of her heart of obedience that she was blessed with five or more children. How many of you know that God is a God of addition and multiplication? That God can help us bring forth fruit and it can begin to multiply. I remember preachers of prior generations got to where they were preaching to the people sitting in the pews of the local assembly about the great falling away. I do too believe there will be a time and we're living in that time of the great falling away. But I also believe that where sin does abound, the grace of God does so much more abound. God does a place like a fiddle to nobody. And I believe until we go into the afterlife to be ever with the Lord, that God's going to still be saving souls. Those that want to be saved, those that want to be delivered, there is still hope for that person on the job. There is still hope for that backslider. There is still hope for that prodigal son and daughter. I want you to hear what the Spirit says concerning that. I'm preaching on, hey, I need a hearing aid. Somebody took one verse of scripture somewhere. And they got to preaching us an us for and no more sermon. And we got so scared as they repeatedly, repetitiously. We're not even supposed to pray repetitiously. But as they preach the same message, service after service after service. We got to believing that it's going to be us for and no more. And God started adding to the church. And we started subtracting from the church because our personal doctrine was being upset. We didn't want to let God come into the equation and do the unthinkable, the unimaginable, and the impossible. But I believe when there's little, God can get into the equation and God can cause that to multiply. Not because of the preaching of Pastor Howell. Not because of the personalities of the laity. But because of the presence of God. Because anywhere God is, there's going to be life. I know there's death in the world, but there's life in the church. I thought we passed from death unto life. He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit said in the churches. Hey, do we need to hear anything? Do we really know what the Spirit of God says? Do we really know what is written? Even Lucifer was reminded at times by Jesus Christ of actually what was written and spoken by the anointed prophet Simon. In our text, may I direct your attention again. The Bible said, And the Lord came and stood and called as at other times Samuel. Samuel. Then Samuel answered, Speak. And this is the part I want you to remember. For thy servant heareth. After that word, Speak. 
there's a semicolon, and then there's a statement for thy servant heareth. This is the problem of this generation. An inability to hear what the Spirit said unto the churches. You all will remember the prophecy up in the end times, in the last of the last days, in the final moments, just before time's clock reaches high midnight. We find that there will be not a famine for churches. There will not be a lack of churches on every city block. There will not be a lack of Bible cemetery, I mean seminaries there will not be a lack of somebody that says I'm a member of the clergy, there will not be a lack of gospel concerts, there will not be a lack of this or that but there will be a lack of hearing the word of God do you know how to have your most holy faith built up yes by praying in the Holy Ghost, do you no one leads you to pray in the Holy Ghost by hearing the word of God. When I hear the word of God, I have hope that things can be better. If we just listen to God, he can have hope that a nation like the nation of Israel, the spiraling downward can turn upward. If Samuel can just have a hope in his heart after listening to God because the situation looks bleak, the ministerial services that are being provided to the nation of Israel are failing the people. Dear Sister Destiny, back there some weeks ago, she said, Pastor, what I like about this church is I can feel the presence of God. Now, she did not give any names, and that's wise. But she said, I've got immediate family members that are ministers. But when I go into that assembly, I do not feel what I feel at Bethel. Now I want you to know that sometimes uh, There are words that must be spoken uh, And nobody wants to speak uh, Because they don't know uh, If they'll be received uh, It's not that they won't be heard uh, It's that they won't be received Now we're going somewhere I'm just laying a foundation So Samuel He realizes That if I can tune out Eli and tune out what's going on with Eli's sons and tune in to God. This generation's running around like the proverbial chicken with his head cut off, Brother Cody. They just running around like crazy, stirring up everything and have no head at all about it. They're senseless. They're not thinking about anything, they're just reckless. Reckless behavior. Brother Nathaniel, if they ain't got a head, they ain't got ears. And that's what's happening right here today. They've got very few people that's got ears to hear what the Spirit says unto the church. And you say, well, I've been blessed to be able to hear the voice of God. You can go to some charismatic church. And if you're not careful, you'll hear one of those charismatic leaders stand up and say, I have heard from God today. And God spoke to me. And you know what? If you listen carefully to what is being said, you'll realize it does not align with what has been written and spoken by the prophets of old in the Word of God. There's people all over saying, I'm standing before you after hearing from God. The teller at the bank will tell you that. Your co worker will tell you that. I know what I heard in my soul but are they really hearing what God is saying we find that Samuel heard some words that Eli would not want to hear how many of you believe that God believes in the chain of command I believe God had been trying to speak to Eli because Eli knew that's God speaking but Eli did not want to hear it because he knew he'd have to deal with some things at home and that's why they don't want to go to a holy 
Baptist church uh, or a Pentecostal church uh, is because uh, they know they got to deal with some things uh, at home. Uh, they just simply don't want to hear it. They think if we have ostrich religion, if we bury our head and our ears in the sand, then we won't hear the predator approaching and we won't even hear our own cries as the predator destroys us. Now I know that there's a lot of preachers on medication because they live with the constant guilt and shame of not telling people the truth because they know there is liberating power when you give people the truth. One of the problems of this generation is not the people in the pew, but it is the preacher in the pulpit who refuses to inform the people in the pew of what is being said. And that's why we just see the spiritual declination of the nation of Israel because Eli, who has now got fat and sassy, so to speak, he is no longer interested in being in that prayer closet and hearing what God has said. He's not interested in getting anointed and bringing a wonderful song to the congregation to sing. He's not interested in giving somebody words of hope or comfort. So God goes to this young man, Samuel, and he begins to speak to him. Now Samuel come from a family that was struggling to have a baby. But whenever this mother got a hold of God and heard God give her that assurance that he was listening to a prophet was born and that every church that is struggling every parent, grandparent, preacher teacher, family member that's struggling with spiritual infertility issues you can't get your children back can I tell you we've got to keep on working we've got to keep on walking we've got to keep on praying believing that God is paying attention you see, when you lose confidence that somebody's paying attention to you, you just give up on them. Really, I remember our English honors teacher. One time, the students in her class were being very dishonorable. They were not paying any attention to her, Sister Beth. And at some point, she said, well, if you can't beat them, join them. And she got in with us, and we partied the rest of that class. Now, I don't know if that's good philosophy or not, but in that particular session, she won our hearts, and she went from being the picked on to being part of the party because she joined the party. Now, I feel like when it comes to preaching the Word of God, you've got to preach without fear or favor. You've got to preach whether you receive affirmation, approval, and applause of your neighbor or not. You've got to preach what God speaks into your heart. And that's what I'm trying to do right here this morning. Hannah knew that God had heard and answered every prayer. And it's comforting to know that we are being heard when we pray, Brother Jesse. How many present have found yourself talking when no one else was listening? I'm sure Sister Wooten could say she's experienced that a lot lately. I don't know why, but that's coming to mind. Right now as I preach, somebody that's got so much to give to the following generation, somebody that could teach so much to them coming up and under her, but for some reason I sense right now the voice of God saying are those around her really listening to what is being said. You see so many people are distracted by other people's presence or other devices and they really are listening to us. I've seen it in the house of God. You notice Brother Cody moved up to the front. There's one reason for that and there's many others. But one of those reasons is to avoid distraction. And they get fixated on the preacher and what God is saying to him. I know last Sunday morning, my bride and I had to leave immediately after the service. When we got in the car, she said, Jeremy, I will never sit in the back of the church again. 
because I cannot believe how easily I was distracted by others and everything that was going on. Don't judge her on that unless you've been in the front and you really know what it's like not to be distracted. I feel the Holy Ghost. Amen. Does everybody still love Pastor? Amen. Looks like everybody's got your spiritual hearing aid in right here now. And so we have found ourselves at times talking on that cellular device. And while we were busy talking, we realized there were no longer any uh-ohs. Uh-huh. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Okay, Brother Jeremiah talked to some people known as motor mouse on the cell phone before, and our cellular service provider somehow dropped the call. I don't know if the satellite wasn't in the right place, the tower wasn't in the right place, or, or what, but somehow that call was dropped, and, and uh, they call me back and say, I was talking for about three to five minutes before I realized the call was dropped and you weren't even on the other line. You weren't even listening. Now how many times do we see Eutychus sitting in the window? He's supposed to be looking at what God is doing on the inside of the church house but he's got an ear tuned in to the parade in the city streets. I'm not interested in sitting in a window with one ear trying to tune in to God and another ear tuning into the world. Oh, young people, let's just go ahead and tune in to God like Samuel did. Yeah. I've been talking to people before and be looking them right in the wide of the eyes and I realize they don't even know what I'm talking about. And Sister How, y'all know the jokester that I can be when I'm not in the pulpit. And I'll say, your mother was born in a zoo. And they do that. I said, you ain't even listening to what I'm saying. And they're doing that. And I wave my hand in front of their face. And after a while, they say, oh, I'm sorry. I was looking up what was going on up the road down there. What is that going on? And I just throw up my hand and say, hey, there's no use in teaching them how to run, run a chainsaw because if they cannot pay attention while well, I'm giving them an instructional and a live tutorial on how to operate a chainsaw, I certainly don't want them cutting a tree next to my house. Oh, come on now. I can see it now. Fire up the old McCullough or the steel chainsaw. And there it goes. The tree falls right on the house. You know what I'd say? You didn't pay attention to that live instructional or that live tutorial. I tried to tell you, and that's what we say so many times to our young people. Samuel's a youngin'. We say, did you hear that message? Somebody will stand up and say, concerning your situation, Pastor preached along these lives last week or last night or last month. The Spirit of God knew you were going to be up against the Spirit of God knew you were going to be facing something. My precious wife is in this building this morning. A week before her father died at the intersection of State Road 640 and 39, I believe it is, there's a little town called Fort Lawson. When we pulled up to that four-way stop sign, Sister Al said she heard the Spirit of God say, check on your daddy. One week later, he was dead. Brother Rick Jacob, you're so right. We live with regrets because we were too busy to listen to what God said. Amen. But on a Saturday, a week later, my wife was getting six little children ready, and I was trying to help her the best I could. And back then on a Saturday, I had a piano in my living room and I would play and sing as we were all getting ready and I don't do a whole lot of that anymore because God has blessed us with wonderful musicians here I uh, very seldom get on the piano maybe once or twice a year maybe and uh, I was playing a song men's hearts failing them for fear 
And my wife and I were busy with six little children. You can never be too busy. You working men. Listen, Brother Cody Hubbard's a good example of this. He's busy working, no doubt, if he's in Naples. I can only assume he's very busy because of the situation. But he looked for an opportunity to come to church and hear what the Spirit says under the church. But I was busy. And we're herding six little children into the vehicle. And I'm telling you, they can get lost quick, end up in a mud puddle. We've had them completely dressed for church and found them in the mud puddle. And so we were busy and focused on them children, but I heard a still small voice. It ain't always in the lightning. It's not always in the thunder. But I heard a still small voice say, go check your answering machine. And so I walked into the house and I went over there to the answer machine and it was flashing just like the Holy Ghost said. And I hit play. And it was Sister Laverne Bass, my mother-in-law. She said, Charity, it's your mama. Come to the house. It's your daddy. Hurry. It don't look good. I can hear them words echo in the corners of my mind and soul still. To this day, I will never forget. Charity, it's your mama. And you know what? I told my bride, come in here and listen to that. Immediately, our plans changed. We had plans of a wonderful day. But we were in the middle of a crisis. But God was in her that moment. If you just open your ears, you will hear what the Spirit of God is saying in the midst of calamity and crisis. The whole nation of Israel is backslidden. Eli, the high priest, is backslidden. King Saul has miserably failed. There's no hope for the new monarchy, there's no hope for the kingdom. Until somebody starts hearing from God. Now the nation of Israel has hope because they got a preacher that can hear from God. They got a preacher that can get a message from God. They got a preacher that people want to listen to. Hey, they can receive visions from God through the man of God. This man right here kept God on the line after this moment. I'm a feeling the Holy Ghost. I knew we had to shout for 45 minutes. We might be a little more out. But I hope you get that spiritual hearing aid turned on. Amen. You may get dropped on a phone call, but God never loses touch with us, Brother Jacob. We may live with regret. How many of y'all remember that sermon I preached, dealing with regret? Amen. We may live with regret at times, but God has given us a way. To deal with that regret because as Sister Jessica said this morning, he is certainly a merciful God. And I preached recently about how God is present. A present help in the time of trouble. In the 10th chapter of the book of Daniel, around the 12th and 13th verses, we find an angelic messenger assuring the prophet Daniel that God had heard every word and that the Lord was working in Daniel's life. The Lord was listening and he heard Daniel the first time that Daniel humbled himself in that difficult situation. The first time he prayed, the first time he fasted, the first moment that his heart broke, Daniel prayed to God and God heard. But Daniel did not stop praying about it. Hannah did not stop praying about it. And I want you to know God was hearing every prayer. We see it in the red back him the lyric goes like this for the Lord has heard and answered every prayer it does not matter if the answer is yes or if the answer is no if God answers that's all that matters so we see that the young man Samuel now has an audience with the Lord just like his mother had an audience with the Lord just like Daniel had an audience with the Lord. Now this is probably to most people a very boring topic. But to spiritually alerted people, this is not a boring topic. We went somewhere while we were on vacation in Branson, Missouri. And while we were in there, we noticed that the elder people were fascinated with the simplicity of the situation. What mattered in the moment. But I told Brother Philip, I said, look. From my generation downward, there is a total disinterest in what is going on. 
And Brother Philip and I began to conversate and talk a little bit. And we said it is because this generation is so easily deterred, diverted, and distracted by all of those devices that they have in their hand. And it just goes to show you that these people, have the older people have busied themselves with the little things, the smaller things of everyday life that really matters. And those people that were not paying attention were missing very important details of of what didn't matter. Brother Steve, get this. We were going to ride the train and go over the scenic outlooks and overlooks of the Ozarks and we were riding on the Branson, Missouri train. And there was about 258 people present. I know because I was the 250th ticket and had to wait on the other 250 people to load. And uh, there was a, a tremendous crowd of 250 people. They said there's 60 to 70 on here on, on Sunday morning. So imagine Imagine four times this many people. And Brother Nathaniel, here comes this feeble holiness man and this feeble holiness woman. And the first thing they did, they asked us to howl. They said, is my cell phone enough to board that train? Now there's some spiritual preaching in that. And Sister House said, no, you've got to have a hard ticket here. And she said, you've got to advance and get in front of all them people if you're going to board that train. And you know what them two old timers did? They didn't ask for assistance. They planned on riding that train. And they got up there and they got their hard tickets and they come back to the end of the line, which impressed me. They were holding us. They didn't try to skip the line or anything. They went right back to the last spot in the back of the train, in the back of the line for the train. And all of a sudden, the conductor got out there and began to talk to everybody on that platform. And I noticed that 90% of the people were not listening to one word that the man was saying. But that old man and old woman, Brother Jesse, their ears perked up. One of them tweaked the hearing aid. You got it. That's desperation for the sermon. Hey, I heard God speak because I was listening. Hey, do you need a hearing aid? They tweaked that hearing aid and they walked over there. And at first I thought they were being rude, Sister How, trying to creep up. But I should have knew better. They skipped the line a lot longer than that. And Brother Jesse, they got to the rail. Couldn't see nobody. Couldn't hear the conductor, really couldn't see. But what both of them were doing sounded like holiness people. Old time holiness people. What I saw, Sister how they were lending their ear to the conductor. And if you've got a tweak of hearing aid in order to hear what the conductor is saying, I'm telling you this train is bound for glory. And we better listen to what the conductor is saying. And the Spirit of God is about to pull down on that cord that lets the whistle blow. And I'm telling us, you can see the signs of his appearing. The coming of the Lord is upon us. We better trim our lips and listen to the voice of the bridegroom. Can you hear it? The midnight cry. Can you hear it? Can you hear it? The sounds and talks of nuclear holocaust. There's sounds and talks of concentration camps. Can you hear it? Can you hear the conductor's whistle saying, come on, get on board. Get on board. I don't want one soul to be left behind. Does anybody want to be so distracted that you get left behind? There were some gentlemen that were told you cannot have a concealed weapon on that train. For whatever reason it was they cited, I cannot recall. But they gave a reason for that. There was one army veteran in the back who was way out of earshot. Brother Jesse, but he was listening so good. And I could tell he's more than just somebody that worked in the kitchen, although I appreciate all members of our armed services. But I could tell this guy was hanging on every word that was spoken. He's paying attention. And a lot of them did not hear the conductor say, you cannot bring your concealed weapon aboard this train. And that man, he told his wife, I'm going to run to the parking garage and put my weapon up. 
He didn't want to part with his weapon. But Brother Jesse, he was a hot tailing it to the parking garage and whenever the train was about to set on track and move up the track a little bit, there he came getting on board. Hey, I don't care if you're in the front of the line or in the back of the line. I don't care if your name's Eli at the front or Samuel in the back of the train. You better be hearing what the Spirit of God says over the church. So we know God hears us. But what we don't know is, do you hear God? We had a pop quiz after every service. We'd find out who's hearing what the Spirit says into the church. Now granted, some men, when we get done after hearing them preach, we have no idea what they preached about. Because they took us on so many rabbit trails. When we get away, we say, what? In the world did they preach on? Well, I'm preaching on listening. Listen. When that still small voice says, hey, go to church. Because I'm going to speak to you directly through that man of God. Hey, go to church. Some people say that's your conscience. It might be. But who gave you that conscience? Speak. For thy servant heareth. So we have an audience with the Lord. However, does he have an audience in us? Look at the latter part of 1 Samuel 3 and 10 again. The Bible said, for thy servant heareth. Our brother read Matthew 11 and 15. Jesus speaking. He said, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. So just because you have ears to hear doesn't mean you're listening. It doesn't mean you're paying attention. Christ said something like this. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. He said it 15 times as recorded in Scripture. But I would say he said it a whole lot more than what is recorded. Eight times in the Gospels. Seven times in the book of Revelations while speaking to John on the Isle of Patmos. He spoke, he that hath an ear, let him hear. In fact, Jesus has spoke these words to his disciples so frequently that John on the Isle of Patmos in the 13th chapter of the book of Revelation, he repeated the words of Jesus and said, He that hath an ear, let him hear. And so the disciples, since Christ has ascended to glory, Brother Sterry, they've been saying, Is anybody listening? You ever seen them old preacher men that are crooked back from all them years working behind the plow? They say, Is anybody hearing me in this house? I know sometimes when I'm preaching on a different topic, I say, Somebody hear me in this house. Uh, why would you say something like that? Obviously, Eutychus was not paying attention to what Apostle Paul was saying because the words of Apostle Paul were quite fascinating. In fact, the character of Apostle Paul was fascinating in itself. If you study history, you'll find that even this man's appearance was fascinating. So there is something terribly wrong with the heart when somebody's not able to use these natural ears that God has given to us how many of you know God gave us one mouth and two ears? Does that mean we're supposed to do twice as much listening as we do talking? How many of you parents have ever heard your little children talking so much incessantly without ceasing? You whisper to your wife and say, hey, turn on some gospel music. <laughs> what are you trying to do? You're trying to drown out the distraction because there's no way you will hear the voice of God in the midst of all that chaos and confusion. This is why we must have quiet time with God. In fact, most of the time when I receive inspiration for preaching is when I have tuned out the train depot and all the people pressing one another in the depot and I get spiritual minded and my wife says honey where are you at and I say I'm in the service Sunday morning I'm listening to the voice of God as he begins to develop that sermon brother Nathaniel and I are missionaries to Dominica and Guatemala and we were in Dominica just a few weeks ago driving through the rainforest and I told brother Nathaniel I said I'm a preaching in my mind right now let me write this down. Huh? Or I say, text this to me. Or hold on while I text and drive. That's a no, no. But I can't lose huh? what God is speaking into my heart. How many of you are getting a hold of what I'm trying to say right here this morning? Jesus Christ was concerned that his sayings would go in one ear and out the other. Does anybody remember that expression used by older people? 
years ago. Oh, what I'm saying is going in one ear and out the other. Here's another one the old timers used to say, you young whippersnappers are no longer familiar with. Huh? I feel like I'm wasting my breath. What good is it to talk to you if you're not going to listen to what I'm saying? How many of you have ever used that expression with your children? Anybody? I feel like I'm wasting my breath. I feel like I'm wasting my time. We don't want the Holy Ghost to ever feel like he's wasting a sermon or wasting a message or wasting the presence of God on us, do we? No. I don't want what Brother House preaching this morning going in one ear and out the other. If the preacher preaches to us of the necessity of being in the house of God, then there must be a necessity. We used to hear these things said by school teachers. I doubt any of you kids are hearing that anymore because they're too busy teaching you about the agenda of the LGBTQ. And you know what? These children are tuning in to that junk. We used to sing a song, this train is bound for glory, this train. And I'll spare us some words of those that wouldn't get on that train. But we used to be very specific in the church. No matter who it offended, if it heralded That's grandma, right. we'd just go ahead and sing them lyrics yes, anyway. Sir. This train is bound for glory. Amen. And ain't going to be nobody on it but the righteous and the holy. This train is bound for glory. But this generation has learned to do like the persecutors and the stoners of Stephen. Put their ears, put their fingers in their ears. And try to not hear what is being said. This generation's figured out it's easier just not to go to church, period. But just because we choose not to go to church doesn't mean that God's not still speaking. That's deep. You can come in the churchyard and stand on the outside of that window and you can see Brother Howell speaking words that are inaudible and you can know that God is speaking but you're unable to hear what the Spirit saith unto the church and it doesn't matter if you're three inches from that window or 30 miles. If you're supposed to be where the voice of God is being spoken, you're supposed to be listening. That's why Jesus would preach on top of the hill. And the hillside, the acoustics would be so good so that the sound would move down into that mass. You heard what Sister Jessica said this morning. She said, I could not hear what Brother Jacob was saying, but I could tell that he was saying something very serious. She didn't know what I was going to preach on, but I said, thank you for that confirmation, Holy Ghost. And our Brother Nathaniel, when he opened service, he said, God, help us to hear what the Spirit of God is going to speak to us this morning. I said, thank you, God. You see, I pick up things like that when I'm listening intently and carefully during our service for God to speak to me. I mean, if I've been praying about a tomato field and I needed God to rain on my tomato field and the only person that knew I planted tomato vines was me and all of a sudden every man in church is talking about tomato paste and tomato sauce and tomato soup, I say, thank God, you heard my prayer. It's going to rain on my tomato vines. People say, what's she so excited about? It's just church. What are they so excited about? Just Brother Howe preaching. What are they so excited about? That's what Eli was doing. It's just the voice of God speaking in the next room. Just speaking to Samuel. You know the Bible said the same would come to him three times. Eli, is this you calling me? Eli said, no son, go and lay down. I'm sure Eli's thinking, I know that's got to be God. After the fourth time, Samuel said, Master Eli, I know that you speaking to me. He said, no, it ain't Samuel. Go in there and lie down. Next time you hear that boy say, speak, Lord, but I serve it here. And what Samuel tuned in to what God was saying, he heard of the horrible things that would happen to the house of Saul, and he heard of the wonderful things that God would do for the nation of Israel. If he just listened. Huh? Just going in one ear and out the other. So many times. So we're saying, when we say, it's going in one ear and out the other, Brother Wood, we're saying that those who were supposed to be listening to the preacher or the teacher weren't paying attention to what was being said. And that person that was saying the things knew that person wouldn't remember it. And so then they just say, what's the use? 
Or it means they heard it, but there will be no effect. Or it means heard, but unheeded. And that is the other thing I heard the Holy Ghost speak to me at the train depot. And I started to title it this. If I hadn't heard God say, I need a hearing aid. And then I heard him say, heard, but unheeded. That is a terrifying thought. To think that some people are not among that number that never hears. But that there are those that are straddling the fence or straddling the windowsill. And they are so busy tuned into the devil's circus that they forget about what's going on in the service. They're so busy about getting enough sleep, so concerned. Sister Howe texted my phone at 9.59, one minute before church started, and she said, Honey, I'm praying for you because only her and God knew how tired I am. So after being out of town for five or six days, when Brother Cody Hubbard and I just first made contact, I was in an airport terminal surrounded by all kind of people. Busy. Traveling from Missouri. Driving from Clearwater to here to the house. She knew, I know you're going to want to hear from God for this morning. And I'm praying because I know even though you're tired and weary in body, you're going to give it everything you've got to deliver to this people what it is you've heard God give you. That's why Sister Wooten, and I speak as a fool, but Sister Wooten will stand up saying 17 years she's never seen Brother Howell one time run us through here with a microwave warmed up sermon. She says, I've never seen him run us through here like a bunch of cattle with a 15 or 20 minute sermon. In. I've never seen him preach something from out of a book. She says it often. I would always hear him bring us a word straight from the portals of glory. Right. And Brother Nathaniel, I wonder if God doesn't have wonderful plans for somebody in this building. God had beautiful and wonderful plans for Samuel, but he was too busy playing Nintendo. I'm too old for y'all, ain't I? Too busy playing Atari. I'm really old. Too busy playing Xbox. Got his toe on the controller. Too busy watching a YouTube video. Too busy. This world needs young men that will tune out that circus and tune in to holy service. I feel like in this building is not one or two or three, but there's a host of young men that God is going to commission to do a great work within whatever local assembly God assigns you to. Don't get misdirected. Listen to the voice of God concerning where you are to be planted and work within that local assembly. There is a work to be done. And Samuel heard it. And it did not go unheeded. But there was a time in his life that Samuel was a child. And because he was immature, he did not recognize the voice as being the voice of God the first time he heard it. Or the second time that he heard it. Or the third time that he heard it. Brother Jesse, would you come to the piano? Our brother read a scripture 
to us this morning found in 1 Corinthians 13 and 11. It says, when I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. How many present this morning believe that listening and retaining what has been heard has a lot to do with development and maturity? Samuel was going to grow up in the faith and become a mighty man of God. But first, he must learn to not be a hearer only, but a doer. I remember when the Lord got my attention. It didn't matter to me if it was a commission to be a street preacher or the senior pastor of a local holiness church. A Sunday school teacher, a bus driver, a minister to the homeless, a minister to the nursing home, a musician, somebody that people could recognize as someone that was tending to service in the house of God, the local assembly. But Sister Wooten, there was something I had to do in order for that to happen. And I'm talking to some young men today and also some young women. We have to grow up in faith. At some point, we have to stop being immature and become mature. While in Missouri, I heard story after story after story of old folks talking about how they got married when they were 13, 14, 15. And I heard my generation telling their kids, don't you dare do that. I learned a lot while I was away by just listening. And what those parents that are my generation and down were saying, you're not mature enough. But these old women that were in their 80s and 90s were testifying of having been married for 60 years. There were people testifying saying the Great Depression was not great. But we survived it. I was 15 years old and was a mother to one. And a husband to a hard-working man who earned a modest living. But hand in hand, they stood there. And brother, I could tell they had time for one another. They listened to one another. That's how relationships last. I know I've sat in waiting rooms with people that are expecting a loved one to pass momentarily. And in comes that person that just will not shut up. There's no greater pet peeve in mind than to be sitting in a waiting room, waiting on a doctor to come in and say, well, they took their last breath. And to be sitting in there offering words of comfort and assurance to the family members. And then here comes this crazy as a loon family member that they see once in a blue moon and comes in and the atmosphere totally changes. And they're talking about everything but the goodness of God. And Brother Nathaniel, that's a very unnerving feeling for pastor. And there's been times that I just wanted to stand up and say, would somebody please tell this person to shut up? Because what I'm doing, I'm listening for footsteps that are coming down that hall. And I'm listening for the turning of a doorknob. And I'm looking for the physician to come out. And I'm looking to see, is that head going up? Or is that head going sideways? I'm trying to tune in to the situation because I know in moments we're going to be ministering to that person. So I'm listening for his voice. I've been in the hallway before while my wife was delivering children and it's almost time. And Sister Wooten, I thought, where's the doctor? The nurse at one point screaming, the baby's coming without the doctor being here. She said, I guess me and you're going to have to deliver the baby. And we did. Was it Nathaniel we delivered, Charity? Jesse? Me and the nurse delivered Jesse. Sister Wooten, the doctor come running in. 
as we held the little baby and he said, could y'all just wait it two more seconds? I thought, Bubba, we've been waiting for 12 hours. Yeah. It was time. It was time. I feel the Holy Ghost up here. It is time. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I came to church. I testified like a child. There just wasn't much to it. I ministered to the things in Eli's shadow. I ministered to the people in Eli's shadow. I understood as a child, Eli, why are we doing this? I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. That night, my testimony become more than three words. I stood up and somebody said, this day a soldier has been born. When I stood up and said, more than, thank God for saving me. I spoke as a child of the faith. I've been hearing like Samuel through the circus, catching remnants, handfuls on purpose just to survive. But that night when I stood up, the whole church knew he's become a man. He's matured. I put away childish things. It's time to put the spiritual toys in the toy box. And it's time to put our hand upon the toolbox and do something for God. Oh, I feel the goodness of God. As we mature or grow up in the faith or even in this life, everything changes. Our words change. Our actions change. Even the way we think. When you go into the doctor's office and you're in a moment of crisis, you don't expect him to walk in ghetto style, do you? You don't expect him to walk up and say, what up, bro? You expect him to be mature. And Brother Thomas stared, that's what they're wanting us to do is dumb down Christianity. They're wanting us to get wordy. They're wanting us to use slang words. They're wanting us to dress like owners of clubs. They're wanting us to act crazy. They're wanting us to bring entertainment to the house of God. They're wanting us to do childish things. But I'm interested in God speaking to us and somebody hearing the voice of God and the hands being anointed with oil and the prayer of faith being prayed and the sick being healed. May we stand this morning. It was time for Samuel to give up his childish ways and to take up the ways of the Lord. He had been under the tutelage of Eli, but it's time for him to be under the tutelage of God Almighty. We know the rest of the story. After this encounter, Brother Nathaniel, he would walk out of that room as the mouthpiece of God. If you would learn to give him the earpiece, you could become the mouthpiece of God. If we can learn how to shut up and go to that prayer closet and after giving God a list of our law and what we need and just listen to what this generation needs. There's somebody in this building that needs freedom. There's somebody in this building that needs deliverance. There's somebody in this building that needs peace. Come and hear what the Spirit said out of this church. If we're mature, you know what that dear sister was saying when I go to other churches? I can't tune into them because they're not tuned into God. If you just give him that earpiece, Lord, all that matters is that you speak to me. We used to sing the old song many times, Sister Howard and I did it early in my ministry. Speak to Lord. Speak the word, Lord. My ears long to hear you. Speak the word, Lord. My heart aches to know. Lord, I don't need Eli's voice. I don't need my pastor's voice. I don't need my preacher's voice. Eli's confusing me. I need your voice. 
I've been up and out of bed three times. I know somebody's talking to me. Who is it? Brother Road Cap service after service. It's God speaking to us. You have supposed it to be Brother Sterrett's voice. You supposed it to be Brother Nathaniel's voice. You supposed it to be Pastor Howell's voice. But Sister Howell can tell you that she has laid in the prophet's bed many a night. And she said, What is it, honey? Talk about the preacher. I said, God's talking to me. While we were out of town, we was at the Marriott there in Springfield, Missouri. Just an ordinary room, room number 410. We're at the, about the third night, in bed on the fourth night, about four o'clock in the morning. I woke up with something. I listened, Brother Buford. It was my wife over there praying in tongues in her sleep. I said, I'm listening. The Bible said that the Spirit itself beareth our infirmities. Sister Wooten, I've had a, a great need in my body for some time now. Because I'm a holiness preacher, the devil can't stand it. He afflicts me. My children understand this. I noticed that the next morning that I saw a radical change in that situation. <laughs> because somebody was hearing from God in their sleep. Now, if somebody can tune into God in their sleep, through the power of the Holy Ghost. I believe I can tune in right now. We've got folks in this building weeping. We've got folks crying. Folks' hearts are breaking. Folks' hearts are tuning in to this wonderful message that God is going to take somebody from being an altar boy to Eli and make them such a valuable instrument in the house of God. Could we bow our heads and close our eyes? I wonder if you... Sir, ma'am, could respond and say, Lord, speak, for thy servant heareth. As soon as Samuel admitted to being tuned into God, God called to him again. Samuel's listening and he answers. There was a willingness to listen. He was committed to hearing what is being said in that moment of time. And Jesus said in John 5 and 24, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Jesus also said, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. You know what the reward is for those that hear him, Brother Sterrett? Life eternal. Young person, God is wanting to make something out of you this very moment, in this very service. I want to ask you, do you need a hearing aid? You know, we can miss hearing from the Lord because of a rebellious heart. God says, seek me and you shall find me. Knock on the door and it'll be open. We hear him but it goes unheeded. I know I need to pray. I know God called me to fire forest to pray. I know God's dealing with my heart to stop all the foolishness. You might be laughed at on the job. You might be mocked, but I'm going to tell you something. Early on in my mid-20s, I started going to my vehicle and reading my Bible on lunch break and praying. I started tuning out the world and what was going on in the break room and started tuning in to God. And I speak as a fool regarding myself, but you too can learn to hear the voice of God 
Is there somebody under the sound of our voice this morning that would raise your hand and say, Pastor, you have preached to me. I know without a doubt God's been speaking to me. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. Whatever it is the Lord has spoken into your heart, bring it to the time of prayer in these altars. Could you do that right now? Men on this side, women on that side. Could we do that, please? Just you and God talk about this. And I want to ask you to listen for that still, small voice. Say, God, I have ears, but do I hear? The Bible spoke of those that would have ears and hear not. Speak the word. Don't let it go in one ear and out the other. A great friend of ours, Brother Edward Day, of the Bronx and Georgia area, had grown up in the house of God, had been a great preacher among his people. He got elderly, got where he needed a hearing aid. A lot of times something would happen. Maybe he didn't have it. Maybe it malfunctioned. And he'd be asking people during the service, huh, what did they say? Huh, what did they say? He so bad wanted to hear what was being said. Can you hear what the Holy Ghost is saying? He wants to make a great person out of you. If you'll just listen and heed So I just owe this thanks to you. 
For it was you, Lord, that took my cross to Calvary. Whoa. 